1966, there was a house here. Now gone, it then belonged to Charles Percy, who that year was a Republican U.S. Senate candidate from Illinois. The home in Kenilworth overlooked Lake Michigan. Then, as now, foliage was about all there was to see, other than a tennis court, which remains to this day. But on September 18th of that year, a Sunday, someone traveled here. They broke into Percy's home and awakened his wife, Lorraine. It was just before 5 a.m., an hour not usually associated with crime. It was also a pitch black morning due to an overcast sky. Mrs. Percy heard a noise and then footsteps downstairs. She later said she thought they were made by one of her children. Unconcerned, she then drifted back to sleep. But a short time later, Percy's wife awoke again and heard someone moaning as if they were sick. She rose from her bed and walked down a second floor hallway. At first she thought the sound was coming from her stepdaughter Sharon's room. But in a moment, she realized it was actually coming from the room of Sharon's 21-year-old twin sister, Valerie. Percy's wife then saw a light shining underneath Valerie's door and opened it. Valerie was still moaning and her head was covered with blood. As if this wasn't horrific enough, there was a shadowy figure leaning over Valerie's bed. He was shining a flashlight on Valerie. Then suddenly he turned and pointed the light in Lorraine Percy's eyes as if to blind her, perhaps to keep himself from being identifiable. I was frozen for a moment and he just stood there, Percy's wife soon told investigators. She then pulled the door shut, ran back to her bedroom, and thought she heard the intruder flee down a staircase. Lorraine Percy then screamed, awakening her husband, who set off the family's burglar alarm. Valerie died a few minutes later. Meanwhile, after running through a rear door of Percy's home, the killer ran southeast in the opposite direction than we're going here. Vernon Roddy, a Kenilworth policeman, saw the Slayer's path in the morning dew on the grass of the bluff behind Percy's house, and then in the sand of the beach below, where the footprints disappeared into the lake. But it was north of Percy's home that morning that police found a glove with blood on it. This possibly indicates that the killer returned to the scene of the crime, however briefly, and may have actually made his escape to the north, or northwest, the direction that we're moving in now. As the footprints disappeared into the water, the killer would have been able to move from there either way along the lakeshore, undetected. The glove was reportedly snagged on the branch of a small tree. It was moved before city investigators had a chance to photograph it where it was discovered. Later, they captured the tree and the glove on film separately. A massive criminal investigation soon followed. Not much more than a week later, it involved local and state police, county investigators, Chicago police, and numerous FBI agents working in Chicago, New York, Northern and Southern California, Arizona, and Florida. Rumors circulated, and news stories appeared for many years, but no one was arrested. Numerous suspects were named, including those from a notorious interstate gang of jewel thieves based in Chicago. Its members were known to area police for targeting wealthy communities such as Kenilworth, where they committed home invasions. Meanwhile, two days after the murder, Percy's daughter's memorial service was held at a church located a block from here. A little more than a month after that, Percy won his Senate bid and moved his family to Washington, where he served until 1984. In later years, Valerie's siblings returned to Illinois, mainly to visit their sister's final resting place on or near the anniversary of the crime. They also visited their former home where their family's friends then lived. But no one from Valerie's immediate family lived in Illinois again. It's been almost 50 years since this brutal and mysterious crime occurred. I recently wrote about the investigation. From documentary evidence to interviews with the book sources, several of whom still live here, it was a fascinating story to research. Most notably, I discovered that there was another suspect, though his name doesn't appear in the old news stories that followed the case throughout the decades. He 
was raised two blocks, a mere five-minute walk from Percy's former home, and his family was living there at the time Valerie Percy was murdered. Though residing elsewhere, the suspect had returned to Kenilworth numerous times in the years and months prior to the Percy murder. Trouble, it seems, almost always followed. His family's former home is still here and looks much as it did in 1966. Much that went on inside it is detailed in the book, Sympathy Vote. You might say it's yet another example of the truth being stranger than fiction. <laughs>